I invite you now to join with me in our prayer of preparation. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We are at week two of our six-week Lenten series on miracles. We started with the idea that certainly there are skeptics. Many don't believe that miracles happen, but there's a lot of testimony, medical evidence, and eyewitnesses to support that miracles really do happen. You can't prove that miracles don't happen simply because you haven't seen one. Instead, we have to rely on the evidence available. And one of the clearest evidences is that of God's love. God has you in His hands. That's a miracle that sticks with you. But today we are focusing on a different kind of miracle, the miracle of birth. So let's start off with a few questions and answers about giving birth. Question, should I have a baby after 35? Answer, no, 35 children is enough. <laughs> Question, what is the most common pregnancy craving? Answer, for men to be the ones who get pregnant. <laughs> Question, what's the difference between a nine-month pregnant woman and a model? Answer, nothing if the pregnant woman's husband knows what's good for him. <laughs> and our final question, our baby was born last week. When will my wife begin to feel and act normal again? Answer, when the kids go to college. <laughs> I remember when Davy, my oldest, was born, Emily had to have her labor induced, so we had a date marked on the calendar for parenthood for us. We would go to the hospital on July 5th, and we actually had a very expensive last meal as a couple with no children at a country club when we headed to the hospital, ready for our world to change, ready to be parents for the first time. I remember being in the hospital room thinking to myself, okay, now I have to remember every single detail of what happens here. First of all, because this is a huge moment in my life. And second, because I'm going to get a ton of great sermon material out of this. I even started taking notes so that I could remember it all. And now that it's a few years later, do you know what I remember from that experience? Nothing. <laughs> I remember that induced labor takes a really long time, and that Davy was born at 4.29 p.m. That's it. That's all I remember. I went back and read my notes from waiting for that first cry from my baby boy, and you know what? They don't make any sense. That might be because Emily was crushing my hand while we were waiting for her to give birth, but I don't really have any real lasting memories from that particular experience. I remember the meal before, and I remember our first drive home, but most of what's in between is a lot of waiting, wondering, hoping, and wishing. There's something about birth that makes it both really wonderful and really painful. Sure, it's physically painful, but there are other things that make it a difficult experience too. When you don't know what you're doing or what to expect, that can be emotionally draining. When you aren't sure what to say to people who keep asking how you're doing, well, that can be taxing too. Even with all the medicine we can give to a woman about to give birth, it's still described by many as the single most painful experience of their entire lives. Not exactly language for something you'd look forward to, is it? Yet right smack in the middle of childbirth, we find one of the most amazing miracles of all. Many of you know Carolyn Veza. She's been a part of this church for many years. She's actually been helping us launch our Saturday evening worship service for the last few months. But she and her husband Rocco shared with me this week about their miracle surrounding birth. You may know this story. Some of you were even involved in it. It happened about 18 years ago when Carolyn was 28 weeks pregnant with her first child. It was around Labor Day and Carolyn found that her water had broken. She was going into labor a full 12 weeks early, which meant there was incredible risk to her baby. Remember, this is almost two decades ago, so the risk was higher back then. 
When they reached the hospital, the doctor told them there was a 50-50 chance the baby would even survive and a 90% chance there would be other health problems or developmental problems later as a result of such an early premature birth. Carolyn was put on bed rest and the doctor said the longer we keep that baby inside, the better. So the church was contacted and people started praying. Some of you started praying. The pastor at the time visited, offering prayer and support. And for a full day there in the hospital, the baby stayed put. For two days, the baby stayed put. Carolyn told me that they heard crying babies every few hours. Once a baby was even accidentally rolled into their room. But as people prayed, Carolyn's baby stayed safely <coughs> in the womb. Rocco told me a funny story about this time of waiting. He said as they were waiting in the hospital, they got to be such a fixture in that place that around day four, while the nurses were gathered together, they turned to him and said, Hey, we're about to do a circumcision. Do you want to come and join us? <laughs> Rocco politely declined and told them he was happy to wait until his own baby was born to go through that experience. Day five and day six passed. Finally, a full week had gone by, and that little baby stayed put. As people continued to pray for a miracle, it wasn't until day ten that that baby finally started to make his way into the world. Carolyn and Rocco braced themselves there was a very real possibility that their baby would not survive. Carolyn told me of all the racial and gender makeups, premature white boys had the worst rates of survival. Yet as she went into labor, surrounded by the prayers of this church, she finally heard the cries of her baby boy. Yes, cries. Her premature baby had completely mature <coughs> lungs and was able to breathe and cry on his own. For seven more weeks, the baby stayed in the care of the hospital and the prayers of the family and church. But the day finally came when little Anthony Christian Veza was able to come home, and though the family watched for it, not one single problem arose from his premature birth, not one defect, not one disability. That's a miracle, folks. And many of you got to be a part of it. Paul, the author of Romans, reminds us that all of creation is groaning with birth pains. We ourselves are groaning in labor. What Paul is saying is that God wants to do something incredible in this world. God is in the midst, in the process of redeeming this world. And we too are in that process. We too are in labor about to give birth to something extraordinary. But it only happens through God. Just like Carolyn and Rocco were dependent on your prayers for the birth of their healthy, screaming baby, we are dependent on God for the good thing He wants to do in us. But my dad, he always had this phrase he used. If he were here with us this morning, he would jump in and say, Brian, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And what he means by that is that God will not force himself on us. We've got to say yes to what God wants to do. If we don't say yes, then it's not going to happen. God allows us to reject what God may desire to do in our lives. So even though God is hard at work preparing to give birth to something incredible in your life, it is up to you to accept or to reject that offer. You can abort what God wants to do in your life. Now, we'll talk more about the long-term consequences of this in a couple of weeks, but know for now that God's big plans cannot be wrecked by you. God's desire for your life, however, is contingent on you. Jesus talks about this in the Gospel of John, and he uses the same language we've been using here today about birth. Jesus is approached in the cover of darkness by a religious leader named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus says to Jesus, you are clearly from God. No one can do these miracles without being from God. 
But Jesus responds, you can't be from God without being born from above. But Nicodemus doesn't get it. He says, how can you be born a second time? You can't go back into your mother's womb again. And here's Jesus' answer. He says, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Jesus is saying to a long-time religious leader, who doesn't get it, by the way, that you must be reborn in God. Your heart must be made new through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the new and beautiful thing God seeks to do in you. And it only happens through a miracle of God's grace and power. Do you want that in your life? Do you want God to do a new thing in you? To remake your heart? To turn the cold ash into a burning flame? It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for a hundred years or if you've never heard the name of Jesus Christ before. We all could use a remade heart. We get burned out and tired, or we've been seeking our way for so long, and it just isn't working. Whatever is happening in your life, God wants to do a miracle in you through a second birth today. I know I need it. Sure, I'm committed to doing good, but I get worn out from trying to do good in my own power instead of through God's power. Let today be a new day for you. Let God remake your heart. We believe that being remade in Christ can be very simple. It's as easy as an honest prayer that says, God, remake me. It can happen through baptism or confirmation. It can happen through the rededication of your baptism. When we get anointed with oil or place ashes on our forehead on Ash Wednesday, we are submitting our lives to Christ, saying, God, do your work in my heart. Make me new. Give birth to the work of the Holy Spirit in me. I invite you to say yes to God's work in your life today. Let me end by telling you about the time I cried while watching the movie Twilight. If you don't know, Twilight is about a young girl who's caught up in the world of vampires and werewolves. It is not a movie I would typically watch. And though some would say they loved the movie and all its sequels, I did not. Say what you will about my opinion, uh, but why did I cry while watching such a bad movie? Let me tell you, in the fifth and last movie of the series, the movie ends with a pretty song called a thousand years. It's meant to capture the enduring love of the young woman and her love interest, Edward. But as the song played, Emily, who was watching with me, told me about a very different meaning for that song. She told me about her friend who went through a horrible circumstance. This young woman was eight months pregnant. She had already named her soon-to-be baby Maverick. Emily told me how her friend woke up certain that something was wrong with her baby. She went to see her doctor, and the doctor told her that the umbilical cord had gotten wrapped around the baby's neck and that her baby had died. Emily told me how this young woman would still have to go through the birthing process to give birth to a stillborn baby. She would have to go through all of the pain of childbirth and never experience the joy of her newborn. Emily told me this song was the song for her baby that would never see this world. I wept as she told me the story. I heard how deep her love was and also how sad her sorrow was. I'd like you to hear a few verses of that song here this morning. This is a thousand years.
Despite all the setbacks, a miracle will be born in you today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, our prayer today is that you would do a work in our hearts. Make us new, Lord God. Help us, help us to say yes to you, that we might have a second birth in our lives, to say yes to your spirit today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. As we close in worship today, let's stand and sing Like a Child from the Black Songbook, number 2092. 